Hi everyone, thank you so much for joining us today. Today's webinar will be about an insight into color theory and values in clips of your paint presented by Yishan Hawk. Before we begin the webinar, there are some housekeeping items that we'd like to go through. The webinar will be approximately one hour long. All attendees will be muted. Question and answer session will be during the last 15 minutes of the webinar. Attendees can ask questions in the GoToWebinar question box right away. Due to time constraints, not all questions will be answered. The webinar will be recorded and the recording will be shared on social media and will be sent via email to all registrants and attendees. The panelists for this webinar are Mario Quinones, myself, and Yishan Hawk. For those of you who connect with us for the very first time or have never heard about Clip Studio Paint, Clip Studio Paint is your only one solution for stunning, ready to publish illustrations, comics, manga, and animations. There are more at clipstudio.net forward slash n and graphicsly.com. Also, if you want to participate interactively with us, share uh, your Instagram stories with our hashtag webinar at Shen underscore DLL at, graphics, uh, at Graphicsly at Wacom and at Cliff Studio Official. We'll share your Instagram stories if you tag us. Yishan Hawk is a self-taught artist from Singapore. She is currently an engineering undergraduate at the University of Cambridge and a software engineer intern at Meta. In her free times, she also likes to do game development and draw pixel art. So with that, I will leave you with Yi Shen and her presentation, an insight into color theory and values in Cliff Studio Paint. Thank you so much. Thank you for the intro. Um, I'm going to share my screen now. So can you see my screen? Yes. Great. OK, uh, hey, everybody. Thank you so much for taking the time to attend this talk. Um, in this webinar, I'll be talking about color theory and values and how you can apply that knowledge to make better artworks. So um, my name is Yi Chen. I go by Chen underscore DLL on Instagram and Twitter. A fun fact about my name is that DLL actually stands for Dynamic Language Library. Um, I am currently studying engineering at Cambridge University and I'm a self-taught artist. I've been drawing for over 10 years, but I only started like studying it more properly through YouTube videos around two or three years ago. So I started off just like copying photos, drawing that kind of stuff, but I wanted to draw more original um, and creative artworks. So I highly recommend watching Marco Bucci's videos on YouTube. It's where I learned a lot of things to do with understanding basic color theory um, and where I started understanding like um, how to use better colors in my artworks and how colors work together. Um, here are so, some of my artwork. I like to experiment a lot with different colors and discover new color palettes that work together. Um, and then I used to also do a lot of traditional painting. So these are like the acrylic paintings I did around 2016, 2015 or so. And um, I worked predominantly with acrylic paints for many years before um, doing digital art. Um, and then I later on in this webinar, I want to show you how, about the tools I use in Clip Studio Paint um, and the ones I like to use to experiment with colors and show you how I went about creating this piece. So firstly, I want to talk about who inspires me. Um, 
I want to show you some of the artists that inspire me. I'm constantly finding artworks that I like. And I would say by observing other artworks on a regular basis, this was a significant factor in helping me to continually improve and evolve my art style. Uh, because if you just look at photo references all the time, um, there's not really that much interpretation um, that you can do apart from looking at the colors that are on the photo references um, and then your own personal, okay, I see what the photo is doing. I'm just drawing what I see. But then other artists have their own um, way of stylizing things, interpreting things, um, both stylistically and also in color um, and some things that you might not um, have seen before you might discover in another person's artwork. Um, the first one, I really love this artist. Um, I love all the color variations that they have in the work. It makes it really shine. And um, these, this right here is like uh, the way that they use the colors to have that subsurface scattered within the water, make it glow. And then you can see between the light and dark shadows how they use unconventional colors uh, for the transition colors between the lights. Um, and also these like uh, color notes in shades of blue within the, the yellow. Um, and then this artist, I really, really like, you should definitely check these out. Um, the, this artist does lots of uh, really iridescent, colorful illustrations, really inspires me to um, experiment with a lot more uh, different kinds of colors, make my artwork quite charismatic. Um, the Mandar is amazing for sh using colors and lighting to uh, do storytelling and um, this artist has amazing composition and really good understanding of colors and values um, and uses that to create these amazing really detailed pieces um, and this guy has like amazing landscapes with beautiful colors that I, um, and then all of these like these color palettes you wouldn't like even think of was would be possible if you're just looking at a photo reference. So that's why I think it's so important to just constantly go out the find artists you like go on Twitter, go on Instagram and see what other artists are doing and try and like break down what they're doing, what you like about it, why you like it and, and see if you can bring that knowledge over to your own artworks to help you push yourself and try new things. Um, as an example of learning from observation, um, I would say that these things here between dark and light areas, there's like this transition color, this band of like bright color. The here it's yellow, here it's orange, um, here it's yellow, here is orange, and then here it's pink, um, here is blue. So uh, what I haven't really seen this like written down anywhere. It's like, you need to do this. I think it's a stylistic choice, but here's an example of what I saw. These artists, they, like they're doing something cool. It does a cool effect. What if I did that in my own artwork? Um, and, and so by looking at that, I would bring that over and try new things. Okay, so I talked about the people who inspire me and now I wanna talk about color. Let's talk about color. Um, and let's decompose it a little bit um, and understand it better. So made color can be composed into three components, hue, saturation, and value. Hue is what people think of when they use the term color. Usually they, it's about, uh, it corresponds to the position in the spectrum. So an example of hue would be like red, orange, blue, green, so on. Um, saturation is the degree of grayness of a color. So here, all the colors, all the shades here, that is all red, red hue, but they are at different saturations. 
and then value is like the relative lightness and darkness of a color and to help you understand that better then um i'll show you this so um different hues at their greatest saturation have different values um you probably heard of this before but it's so important to get so used to it and comfortable with it that it comes like second nature when you're painting because um once when you have that down it helps you so much more in understanding of what colors can i use here and um, to make things uh, so that it makes more sense so um here is what i mean uh when you have hue technically speaking everything on the left side is blue everything on the right side is yellow like the shade of yellow technically speaking um saturation um on the left here you have most saturated on the right you have most saturated blue and yellow and then the middle is where is no saturation and this by the way is a really good way of visualizing temperature and how um, blue might transition to yellow usually through the grays um, and then values would be um, what you see here with the darkest to lightest value another thing to note here is that the yellow at the highest saturation is at a higher value than the blue um, i'll go into this in more detail but um that kind of basic knowledge is really important um, when you're drawing just to keep that in mind uh, but then the next thing is that color is relative so um see here we have a blue and then we have this area which will feel more like a yellow um and even if it's not exactly a yellow and then as an example i'm going to take everything away and leave you with just this that color right there is technically just a gray but it feels more like a hint or a shade of yellow because um it is it is um it it feels more like a shade of yellow because it's in the direction and your eye sort of sees the motion of um color towards the yellows is going in this sort of direction um and then as an example of how you might apply that to your artwork um here is a, one of my paintings of sucrose i I use blue here for the um, darkest color, but I made it really saturated. And the reason why that works is because it's the darkest value. Um, and I use that fact to convey and carve out the shapes um, and use this light area here. So the silhouette is um, very clear and you know what you're looking at. Okay. Um, very, very brief note about color palettes. I won't go into this in too much detail because it's uh, a whole thing of its own. But um, typically most paintings won't use every single color available in their painting. You probably heard that the color wheel is like a blessing and a curse because you have all the colors available, but if you use every single color, it kind of looks bad. Um, a lot of paintings might use um, different kinds of color palettes to convey different moods. But in the painting, whatever color palette you end up using, as long as your values are correct, it will look good. So the first thing a person reads when they see your painting are the values and not the colors in your artwork. I'll give you an example. So this is a painting I did in Clip Studio Paint. I, choose, I chose primarily purple, yellow, complementary colors as my color palette. Now, can you spot nine animals not including the cat and the human in this painting i'll give you five seconds okay so you guys probably spotted the two ladybirds and the lizard but did you see there's also three geese in the background and also three birds in the sky um i like to use this painting to demonstrate like as long as your values are correct 
because um, I put that thing, the the values um, range that I use for the sky in the background is close together in the high end. And um, so it means I can throw in as much detail as I want without impeding on the overall message of the drawing. So um, here I want to emphasize the importance of value for readability. So value is so important here. Um, here I zoomed all the way out and I do this quite often when I'm drawing as well. You zoom out and can you still see what's going on? Does it still read? Um, and you can see that when we turn it to black and white, you have kind of three main things going on here. You have the foreground, the cat and the girl, and then you have the background. And because the colors are chosen such that they're within that value range, um, the message still comes across, but I can throw in all that detail that I want. And this, I would say, is inspired by that artist, one of the artists I showed you before with the composition, because similarly, they use um, this kind of idea to um, fit in those details um, and make their work look cool. And what I really like about this is this kind of work is where, okay, the first time you look at it, you can see, okay, I see what's going on. There's like these flowers and there's the kind of girl. Cool. But then, because you don't notice like the details, it's a piece where the more you look at, the more you see. And then I thought, think those pieces are super cool. So I want to talk a bit about, oh, and before that, this is kind of the zoom level I often work at when in drawing this piece. Like this piece, I mainly do this um, at this stage, probably 95% of the way of the whole piece. I didn't really zoom into the details until I got everything in place. Um, because if you zoom into all the details, you could end up over rendering total vision and then uh, could end up like a Frankenstein of a painting. And so it's really important to, to zoom out often, see the big picture um, is important for readability. I want to show you a little bit about the process. So um, here's a mood board I use for this uh, painting. I, alongside photo references, I also have what you call these quasi references. I like to use this because um, these, I'd say like, it, often these are like color references, general vibe references, references style references um, from artists I like, and they might not necessarily be exactly what I'm drawing, but um, having them up on the side whilst I work, often I find the, the mood, the vibe, the colors kind of infuse over. Sometimes I look at what's the relationship between this color and this color. I kind of want to use that in the small aspect of my work. Um, so having those up on the side alongside all your other photo references um, can be really good. And I mean, uh, obviously it doesn't have to be in this style, can be in whatever style you want that you're interested in. Um, now I want to move over to Cliff Street Paint where I'll show you um, a little bit more uh, on this painting. So I recorded this time lapse and main thing is after doing the sketch for this painting, um, I had like, I, I blocked out the whole painting in mainly three layers, the background, the middle, uh, the subject, the cat and the human and the the flowers before going straight into colors, which I just use tone curves. I just use curves and um, set it to a, val uh, a color and started rendering color on top of it. Um, I did this because it's a really important to see like overall what your value is going to be like before you dive in and you go into all the color details. Sometimes if it's like a fairly simple piece, um, you can just go straight into colors, but when going for more bigger complex pieces, even going back to just planning um, and grayscale, these kind of things is really important. Um, yeah, I, but I don't go into too much detail. Um, like I don't render out um, 
anything at all really in grayscale because um, I feel like if I'm going to do a lot of like color variations, that's not going to come through in the grayscale either. Um, and also you see, you see people do this a lot when they do thumbnails and they do these ideas for pieces that they want to make. Um, and it's just really good. So you could get bogged down with color and stuff, but values and getting that right is still mo uh, the most important. Um, okay, then um, the next thing I want to talk about is um, a way that you can practice. So one way you can practice this color value thing is doing black and white um, studies. So as an example, here um, I want to draw this, but in black and white. Um, so I want to make sure that overall the silhouette reads reads well. And that's the most important thing. Um, you could see that the colors on top are, uh, the colors here are, are brighter, but then overall the dark value over here still makes the silhouette of the cat and the croc more um, pronounced. And so being able to translate back and forth between color and value, um, this would be a really good exercise in practicing that. So I did finish this, this drawing um, pretty much at this level. I never went more, in more detail. Um, and here I made sure that you can also check this in your navigation menu in the top right. Um, and this goes back to what I talk about readability. So I gave an example here where things are a lot more difficult to read and understand. Um, and the shapes and the silhouettes aren't clear. And I'd say that is because um, here, I say that is because here and here are pretty similar in value. You have the shadow shape, which, which doesn't convey the silhouette of the shoe that well and also the shape of this shadow is so prominent it kind of overshadows the overall shape um, along with these these colors here that are way too light and this one being way too dark and also no no um value distinction here makes it really hard to see the overall shape and so when you zoom out when you look at this you're like what is this but then this one makes a lot more sense because um, i fix it here with making sure this border here i have that that distinction and also over here and the shape that you see um, makes a lot more sense even when you zoom all the way out um, and so that's one way, drawing um, studies, but um, looking at colorful pictures and drawing them in black and white. Now, um, another way you can practice, which I think is, the hard, is harder, but also really good for practicing, is doing it the other way around. So I took these Asaro heads, you can Google like uh, male 3D reference head model, you can find this in ArtStation. Um, but getting these SR heads with like different lightings is mostly pretty grayscale. So the idea is here, I would get the color wheel and I'd use the most saturated colors in the color wheel and practice like seeing how dark or light there are and then kind of do like a mapping over to see the uh, like the darkest values map over darkest values that's also another really good way of practicing um, and one good way of checking that your values are right is to uh, go on top uh, put add a layer on top like this the black layer um, here I would this is just like completely black layer set that to color color blend mode and that's a really good way of checking your values in black and white there are other methods but um 
I don't think this is the most accurate either, but it's a good way if you're still trying to figure out, okay, is this lighter or darker, but don't rely on this to give you like the answer because always, always look at it and see, because um, right here, I would say this color right here and this is pretty much the same or similar, but it comes out as pretty different under the color blend mode. So it's just an indicator. But one way you shouldn't, uh, one what you shouldn't do to check for color is um, go on Control U or or Edit Tonal Correction Hue Saturation Luminosity and turn that saturation slider down because as you can see, it just turned all the colors around the uh, on the outside to the same gray, and that's obviously not correct for the values. Okay, the next thing I want to um, talk about is just like an observation that you could keep in mind whilst you're practicing these sorts of exercises. And that would be um, uh, using, if I'll turn on this color blend mode here, and what I observe is like, it's not just that blue is the darkest value and yellow is the highest value of the most saturated um, colors that you can have. Um, you it, you kind of get these spots of dark and light. So so here blue, um, here blue kind of, um, it gets lighter in value from blue. And then it gets darker again once it reaches red. There's like a dark spot here and it goes light again and it goes slightly dark again, and it goes light again, and it goes dark. But um, of of these three, the red, green, blue, uh, blue is the darkest, red is second darkest, green is lightest. So uh, that's some something cool to keep in mind when you're um, trying to do that kind of exercise because it's not that you just can't you can just go from yellow to to green to light blue to blue in order to get from light to dark because it's not as straightforward as that um and as for color choice here i will note briefly about how the reason why i picked red for the ears even though red this could be is just as dark as like this purple here so i'll show you when this, this is just as dark around as about this color here, but um, it seems a lot darker than, um, uh, this seems a lot darker than this. And um, it, I wanted to save it for the ears in the backlighting because it's kind of like subsurface scattering through the ear when you know, when you shine light through, through your flesh and then you see the red glow. Um, so I guess I kept that in mind when I was um, creating these, but um, yeah, this would be a really good exercise to get you more comfortable with colors. Then uh, the next step after this would be um, just picking an assortment of colors. It doesn't even have to be the most saturated colors in the color wheel, just any color, um, any color palette and seeing if you can do that color mapping in your head in a similar way. Um, and that's exactly what I did here. So I wanted to show this because um, this is like a study of a subway that I did a while back, but I was really inspired by the colors you get from iridescent PVC. And this top, um, this top picture was exactly what I was looking at when I was painting this piece. Um, and what I did here was I looked at what colors are in the highlights here, um, and then I kind of it brought that over to the lightest areas. Then I was like, okay, the, there's like this really nice dark cyan, uh, saturated cyan um, transition color. So I used that here and I used that here um, to transition between the light and dark areas. Uh, purple, uh, there was a lot of dark and deep purples in the shadow areas. So I'd use that here. Then I'd use like hints of, I'm not really sure what this bright yellow would be called, 
but um, I use them in the highlight areas too. Um, and so this was another way of doing like a color mapping and just practicing seeing the colors for their values. Um, and you can do that with any colors that you like. If there's an artist that you like and you really like the colors, um, you can see what color did they use for dark values? What color did they use for light values? Um, and then just do a study, but a color study and kind of do that brain, uh, mapping in your brain and try and figure it out. It's not fun if you just like slap a, a, a color, uh, this color blend layer on top because um, it removes that step that you're doing in your brain that um, helps you with understanding the colors, color and value relationship. Um, and as an example, I also did this study of a hand um, where I use very saturated blues and pinks. And for me, I also find, found this pretty challenging because in my head, I had to try and keep track of, okay, what value actually is this, is this um, saturated orange here? Where does it fit within everything else? Uh, but by doing that and getting the values right, you can see that you can see it just looks like a normal hand um, in black and white and the colors work work out pretty nicely as well. Um, okay, the, the next thing is on color vibration, which I use a lot in my works. Um, so color vibration, you might have heard of this before, you might not have, but um, it's basically when you have a color that uh, and another color next to each other, the edge seems to vibrate a little bit because they are kind of the same value, but um, one might be much more uh, saturated than the other, but because you have this next to each other, the same same value, get this kind of like vibrating edge. Um, and different hues will have, uh, well, in, in order to pick out that, uh, th those same colors, you need to understand that different hues will, um, it, what I said before about different hues having different values at the greatest, uh, at the greatest saturation. So for example here, if you went from a gray and you wanted to map out a contour of lines that had the same value, it will kind of go up up this way a little bit. Um, but if you were to do it here, it would be a lot more steeper. Um, as, as the same with this blue here, would map to a pretty dark, um, gray here, whereas this yellow probably maps to this this color, uh, this value of gray here. Um, and to make it more clear, here is where um, the contour lines will be drawn out and what that looks like in black and white. So the idea is like all the lines um, follow um, lines of the same value for that particular color. And then understanding that you can pick out these different colors that have the same value and um, apply them. So in this example here, um, I uh, pick this reference and you can see there's mainly there's this shadow region here. And there is the light region on the other side. So this this shadow region, I've sort of chose colors that are sort of the same value, but then I kind of tried to use that color vibration thing to introduce different hues whilst it still makes sense. Uh, but within that, all the values are kind of the same. And then here, I did the same, but with lighter values. And one way you can do that nicely is on the shadow, uh, for example, on the shadow side, you can introduce different color notes. I like to use soft light blend mode. So um, to, to introduce color notes. So I'd use this layer of soft light here 
to introduce color variations within the shadows. That's just one way of doing that. Because the reason why I like to do that because it creates this subtle hue variations without messing up the value way too much. Um, and then to explain a little bit further, my my friend had made like a tweet about this explaining um, this color vibration effect. Um, so for him, he used Photoshop, but because the before and after tool you have this in Procreate as well, is really good for controlling and checking your values. So you can see in this particular example, it has like that vibrating edge. Um, and that's because they are very similar in value. And it's also the same for, for this one, uh, for, for this one here, because they're very similar in value. And it's really easy to pick that out when you have the before and after circle. The good news is I did find find out pretty recently that um, Cliff Studio Paint on the update coming on the 28th, they will have this before after circle. So you can see, like you can pick one color, like like this color here, and then and then you can pick another color whilst this before after circle shows you the before and after. Mean, meaning that it makes it a lot easier to see those colors right next to each other and you can just click around, drag around in the color picker to see which colors match. So right now in the current Cliff Studio Paint, it's a little bit of trial and error, but what you would do is like you'd have a gray and then say you wanted to go up to blue, you'd, you could click on the secondary color here, color pick this, go back um, and then pick a color that is similar in value. So I'm looking at this square here, but if you go up too high to uh, low, you can see it's obviously the wrong value. Um, and so around this area, there's like a sweet spot where you can put colors that kind of very close in value and they kind of vibrate. And I use that a lot when I'm drawing to introduce interesting colors. Um, and then as for examples for color vibration, um, here are some drawings I did um, and I found that you can use this to your advantage to create kind of like a neon effect. I did this with um, a grayish background and using more saturated colors that are um, similar in values. Um, and then you can see it especially here between this gray and this the screen here and also the the pink shades here um, and also especially the area between this pink and this blue here. Um, and then I think the last thing I was going over is this example. So um, I want to show you how I created this painting and the experimental tools I like to use. This is um, the reference photo that I used and um, basically started off with the sketch and then um, just blocked out the silhouette. Slapped in some colors, mainly just putting in a few colors here and there. I wanted it kind of generally to be yellow and blue. Um, and the reason why I'm sharing you this is not because I started out with a color palette and I'm just drawing it all the way through. I am um, I am trying to use the tools here to experiment and find new color combinations that will look nice. Um, and I think I could just start with a color palette and just go um, and finish the drawing with my color palette in mind. Or I can experiment and see what works well, maybe discover something new. Um, I add in a few more textures, but here I feel like, okay, the head is supposed to be the focal point. The legs kind of get lost into the background. So to make the values more uh, readable makes more sense. Um, like when you zoom all the way out, you can see much more clearly here is a pigeon than it was before. Um, you can see in the navigation menu as well. Um, and some tools I like to use to 
uh, is if you go on one select up here and then you select you make sure apply to connected pixels only is unselected um, you can select everything of the same color in your painting so I'm going to select everything that's like kind of yellow here then I can control you bring up the hue saturation luminosity and then change the the hue so just changing the hue will look bad because the values won't be the same so I'd like make this lighter to kind of match the previous value and this is like a really quick and easy way for you to cycle through color palettes and for you to experiment with um, new c combinations of colors without you having to draw over everything. Um, and what I like to do after doing this is keep some of those edges in. So I use a slightly textured brush, doesn't really matter what, but often when your brush is slightly textured, you use that select tool. It will have some harsh, harsh textured edges. I'd soften up some of those edges um, like this. I'd soften it up a little bit, but then I'd, I'd keep some of them in because um, I think it looks really interesting. So it's kind of like an accidental interesting effect. So um, doing that, I can experiment with different colors. Another way I do, um, do it is by um, experimenting with curves. So this layer here um, is actually created by literally playing about with edit, tonal correction, tone curve, playing about with like the different values and things here. It could end up looking really bad or you can go onto um, the different channels to selectively manipulate the different colors. Uh, but anyway, I created this layer through playing about with different um, curves. Um, and then I played it about with blend modes and I found that this on top of what I had before looked pretty cool. So um, I kept that in. And you can probably also notice that another thing I did here was um, I, I used the lasso tool. So um, say, say it was here. I wanted the wings to be darker, right? I thought they were too light. So I used the lasso tool here um, to select this area and just tone it down a little bit. Um, but often when you make things darker, there's also a hue shift because um, towards like the cooler or warmer colors. Um, I just do that as a really quick way of just bring that value back in. And if the colors are wrong, I can fix that up later. Um, because I threw in the colors at the start, but then I was thinking, oh, the values aren't quite right. Um, and then making the values darker or lighter to adjust for that. Um, so after experimenting with these uh, things, I thought it was a little bit too much variety, sometimes less and more. I wanted to go back to that blue yellow color palette um, I desaturated it a little and then brought a bit of color back using overlay layer and then all this time I was using these tools to experiment to um, work towards something that uh, I'm happy with and find a color palette that looks kind of cool so with this I found something it predominantly it is uh, blue, green, with hints of purple, and lots of hints within here of different kinds of colors. But you have three a predominant color palette going on here. But because of the, all this experimentation, you also have these accidental colors and textures that happened as a result along the way. Um, and so I was pretty happy with that. Now it's just a case of color picking from what you have here and just rendering out your whole drawing. And that is the process of uh, a way I'm, I may go about experimenting with colors in a drawing. Um, and then 
Lastly, I want to end with like key points. So I talked about values, um, ways you can experiment with um, and practice your values, um, and avoiding tunnel vision, zooming out and seeing the big picture. Use that navigation menu you have in Clips Your Paint. Um, zoom all the way out, uh, all the way out, and see can I still understand what's going on there. Um, and then just experiment, get out of your comfort zone, try different colors, look at other artists that really inspire you, what are they doing there, observe what they do, try and break down what the effect it is that you really like and see how how they're doing it. Maybe it's like the relationship between the colors, maybe it's the way that they put things in certain places. and. I would say definitely like just observing other artists is a great way of getting up, making yourself get out of your comfort zone, trying new things, especially if they have a very different style from what you currently do. And just have fun with it. So yeah, I hope the webinar is still going on. <laughs> um, and it that is. is my presentation. <laughs> yes, amazing. Thank you, Thank you so much. And, uh... It's been a bumpy ride in the last minutes, but uh, thank you so much for reconnecting. Yeah, no worries. I hope it was really helpful. Um, I hope people got something out, out, out of it. Yes, there there's still uh, a lot of us here. Um, as I mentioned in the break, we, let's call it a break. <laughs> there's people from all around the world. So thank you all for staying with us. Uh, there was uh, who are having breakfast, dinner or lunch. Um, <laughs> So let's start with a, a very interesting question uh, from, let me check, Francisco Ruiz uh, said, says, I consider colors and emotions are closely linked. How do you work uh, with this matter? Colors and emotions. I think this is a lot to do with like color palettes. Um, I know I didn't touch on so much on color palettes, but color palettes is a huge way of um, conveying mood but also it's not just color palettes but also like your value range and where you decide to uh, what what you decide to use for your value range so for example if you wanted something very like um, c cinematic very dramatic very um, uh, epic or intense you might have like super high contrast uh, maybe lo lots of shadows um, and and then within within that you might choose colors that, that fit it or even like like limit your color palette so if you wanted to go for a more sad mood you might use less colors you might use um, a more monochromatic color palette um, often something like a triadic color palette where you use like um, colors from corners of the color wheel um, like red green blue purple those colors are usually associated with a lot more happy colors they used a lot in mario um, and those kind of games and um, you can see a lot of these examples from artists who try and convey a mood through the choice of color palettes um, yeah so that's that is how mm -hmm. I'd go about it. Mm -hmm. uh, another question from Shane Shannes. How many layers do you regularly use when applying colors? One. <laughs> I, <laughs> I usually use one layer. Um, for my, for all of these drawings here, I use one layer. For this drawing, I use one layer. For this drawing, I use one layer, and for this drawing, I use three layers. Um, I can actually break it down here for you. Um, I, I mean, I have like small layers for small things on top, but predominantly this layer and this layer and the background. So I think that having way too many layers, you can have um, can be a little bit confusing and be like, oh, this needs to be separate from this. Um, I like to use layers when it is convenient, when I, uh, when I need to, but otherwise, 
if I like to achieve that kind of painterly look. So um, I also like to have colors merge into each other. I like to control the edges of shapes. And sometimes some edges or some objects will have sides that kind of blend into their background and some will have really harsh shapes. And you can't really achieve that very easily if you're constantly thinking about trying to separate these objects by layers. Um, so yeah, I work with mostly one or as few layers as I can when I'm painting. Mm -hmm. Another question from Daniel Serini. Digital painting is great and has a lot to give and Cliff Serpent is so amazing. But what's, what's the best way to transfer the digital work into solid or printable form? What's your experience uh, with this vibrant color RGB to to print till, printable colors? Um, I've only ever printed my work once, um, but I look, I can't remember what I used, but I looked at the range of colors that they can print. So different kinds of printers and inks will have um, like different kind of finishes and whether it is, um, very color heavy might mean it's, it, you know, like when you have like a fresh photo and it's kind of sticky, but it's it, like an inkjet photo. Those kind of glossy prints are usually the best for these really vibrant colors. And when I printed, I print, actually printed this one out as a print. The colors were really, really vibrant on the paper, but um, you just have to be like read first if you're going for a printing service um what kind of things they offer because um often um i'm also not like an expert on the printing side but they will have like a limited color range that they can print and it might be that your colors will end up being a lot duller because i've printed out some of my work on literally normal printer before and the colors were so limited that it really changed the way that it came out well, when I tried to print it. Mm -hmm. uh, Lina asks, does cycling through different color palettes with the select tool replace a potential thumbnailing approach to choosing a color palette for your pieces? Or do you also sometimes save versions to compare later on? Um, I I don't really say versions. I just kind of go through the process and because I feel like if I say versions, which I've thought about before, I get a little bit too like attached to something. Um, I just want to try things out and um, explore more options. And often there's no really right answer. Um, if I see something that I really like that it, that it, some color combinations are super wacky that I ended up creating. I'd like save that um, on the side and just keep it as like a reference for a future piece of artwork. Um, as for replacing thumbnailing, no, I don't think it would replace thumbnailing at all. I don't think I thought about it in that way either. Um, thumbnailing in itself is a super useful tool. It's like just planning out jotting down ideas for a whole drawing in a really fast way as well. Um, and then the cycling through color, um, the select and cycling through colors is, um, it, thumbnailing I think is more about planning your values. And then when I cycle through the color in that example there, I made sure that when I change to a different hue, the value of the color I changed to was about the same as it was originally. So um, in that case, technically, it doesn't affect the thumbnail because the thumbnail is all about like the values and what your piece looks like when it's super small, like the overall big picture. Mm -hmm. Another question is, as a self-taught artist, uh, what made you choose uh, Clip Studio Paint? Where, what were the features that impressed you to start working on, on the software? Um, I switched over to Clip Studio Paint mainly because I, I've, 
I like that I didn't have to pay a subscription for it. There is, and also the other thing is I like that the newer version had the time lapse. And I procreate had the time lapse, but I really like the time lapse option because before I tried to screen record my work just like using OBS or something, and it, I feel a lot of pressure just pressing record. Um, and it records my whole screen and have to think about it. But just the fact that you can just take it, turn it on and then just have it on the side and forget about it. But a lot of pressure off recording my process. So I really like that. Um, I did use a variety of things before, like Photoshop, um, Krita, GIMP. I used GIMP for a long time <laughs> before I realized Photoshop even exists. Um, and I just like this also because it was slightly more lightweight than Photoshop. A lot of times I draw for a long time and um, the the program would build up a lot of cash. And if I'm not careful, it would say, oh, there's no more cash, no more memory. I can't save my work anymore. <laughs> that's, that's really good. And um, another question from Alex Guerra. Uh, what makes you to engage in art, even your engineering background? And was uh, the shift hard? Any advice for artists coming from a different background now on art? Did you say was the shift hard? Uh, like yes. The shift? Um, I I'm still doing this as a hobby. Um, I'm still figuring what I, out what I want to do. I graduate university next year. Um, I never thought of it as a shift because I've always been doing art since I was very young. Um, as I mentioned before, I've been doing art for like 10 years, but I started off like on these websites like Chit Chat City, Cycle Paint that most people wouldn't have heard of and they could have gone forever along with all my art on the, those platforms. But I do so much, but using these like um, small in-web drawing tools, which meant that like if Chrome crashed, then so did my drawing progress. Um, and so it was just a thing that I always did. And um, engineering, I, ch I chose engineering because I liked to make things and create things. And I'm not going more into software engineering, but I'm really into um, game development. I've created a few mockups for games, but I never really finished them. Um, and I also really like um, people and artists who tell stories through their artwork or any sort of medium. So I kind of see them like not separately, but two things I hope, hope that I can bring together eventually sometime in the future. Um, I'm not sure exactly what could be that I do. I make my own thing, I make art and then I program for it too or I become a technical artist, but I think they're a lot more interlinked than most people think. Um, so yeah, I really enjoy doing both. <laughs> mm -hmm. And just to close uh, the webinar, because uh, we know that, uh, and we want to thank you all who stayed here um, in the lapses that we have. Uh, Chen, one last piece of advice for anyone who is still uh, struggling with color. Mm -hmm. Oh, okay. Well, last piece of advice. I think definitely do those studies and practice the the value stuff I mentioned. If you get really comfortable with that, um, things start to become a lot more easier. And the other thing is like, keep finding artists you like, save their work, go back to it, keep looking at it, maybe even on, on a daily basis. Um, because even if you aren't drawing, I think observing is a huge part of drawing and you kind of get stuck in your own loop if you're not really looking at what other people are doing. So yeah, that definitely just keep finding artists you love and keep looking at their work and trying to understand how they made the, the, their work. So with those wise words, uh, once again, thank you so much, Jen. Yeah, thank you so much. Um, 
and for the opportunity. And thank you so much to everyone who attended. Yes, we want to thank you, all of you who attended. Um, once again, uh, learn more about Clip Studio Paint in our website, clipstudio.net forward slash n, graphicsly.com. This webinar has been recorded and will be uploaded to our YouTube channels, Clip Studio Paint channel and Graphicsly. And for more information about Chen, follow her on her social media. She's as Chen underscore DLL on Instagram, Twitter, our station, Twitch, and also check our website. Uh, again, thank you so much, Chen. Thank you. Thank you, everybody, as well. Thank you all, and we hope to see you in our next webinar. So stay tuned. Bye bye. Thank you. Bye, everyone.